test microphone. Yep, cool. Excellent. Does the other one work? Should I just talk loud? I can turn this one off. Um, if you, want. you can talk loud. You can mm -hmm. only on for about a minute or so. Yeah. Cool. I, can, I can have yeah. one of these. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's lecture. Sorry for the, the slight delay. I'm going to blame the rain for that one. <laughs> um, I am Amanda Bauer. I'm, I work at the Australian Astronomical Observatory. I'm an astronomer there. And I'm very happy to bring you tonight's lecture in conjunction with UNSW, who's, who's uh, happily hosting the event. Uh, and tonight we welcome a very special speaker who's in town from the UK. She has done a lot of work building some of the most high-tech instruments for the biggest telescopes that exist in the world today, and even the ones that are going to be in the future, the 30-meter telescopes that she'll tell us about today. So Dr. Sarah Kendrew did her PhD at the University College of London, and then spent some time working in the Netherlands and then Germany, and now she's back at the University of Oxford with the research fellowship and has recently accepted a position with the Space Telescope Science Institute in the U.S. So she will be moving there early next year, just in time for winter. Uh, but she's in town now for a couple different astronomy-related program or conferences. One was last week talking about uh, software in astronomy, and this week we're hosting a dot astronomy conference, which she has helped organize for the last seven series. This is the first time it's in the Southern Hemisphere, so we're very pleased that she has been able to come down and join us for this. So without further ado, Dr. Sarah Kendrew discussing giant telescopes of the future. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks to uh, UNSW for um, hosting, hosting me. Um, solar eclipses. Solar eclipses are some of the most spectacular things, spectacular phenomena um, we see in the sky. Uh, and they've long fascinated humans. Uh, we know that. This is a beautiful picture of uh, a recent annular solar eclipse that was visible from northern Australia just a few years ago. They're some of the most beautiful things you can, you, you can really see, and it's very privileged to be able to witness them. But to set the scene for this talk, I'd like to take you back to 1919, um, when there was a very uh, important uh, solar eclipse in the history um, of science. Going a few years further back, exactly 100 years ago, at, um, this year in fact, uh, Albert Einstein presented his, uh, his theory of general relativity for the very first time uh, to his colleagues. So this is a big year for general relativity. Uh, this was a really groundbreaking new theory describing, uh, describing gravity. Um, and with the theory of general relativity, um, Einstein really described how the fabric of the universe, space-time, which we call space-time, uh, is warped by the presence of massive objects like stars or galaxies. And so uh, light, when it passes by such massive objects, actually has to get bent around it. And so gravity the, the, the attractive force of gravity, as we see it, is actually the result of this warping um, of, of space-time around massive objects in the universe. This is a really dramatically new theory. Um, so, you know, it was quite sort of... Uh, it, didn't, it didn't gain an awful lot of traction in, when it was first presented. But one of the key predictions of general relativity is that when we look at the night sky, we see, you know, fields of stars in the sky, but what, what general relativity predicts is that if a very massive object were to come in between us and the stars in the night sky, like, for example, the sun, then the positions of the stars would actually appear to shift on the sky because the light would have to bend around the massive object, our sun. But, of course, the only time that we can see the stars in the night sky and the sun at the same time is during a total solar eclipse. So it was recognized very early on that this would be a really important test of this brand new theory of general relativity. And a number of scientists um, in the UK set out to actually perform this test. And there was this eclipse in, uh, in May of 1919 that gave the perfect opportunity to perform this measurement. Um, this expedition was led by Arthur Eddington, who is also you know, a very, very important astronomer of that era. And he was a very big supporter of general relativity. So he um, and the Astronomer Royal at the time in the UK, a man called Frank Dyson, they coordinated uh, these expeditions to the parts of the world where this eclipse was going to be visible from, which is sort of travelling all the way over the Atlantic Ocean. 
they, they led the organization of these expeditions. Um, it's a really fascinating episode in, uh, in the history of science. And there's lots and lots of interesting anecdotes uh, related to it, but essentially these two expeditions traveled, one to the um, east coast of Brazil and another to the uh, island off the West African coast of Principe. Um, these measurements were performed during the eclipse and they did indeed see the shifting of the positions of the stars um, during the uh, totality of the solar eclipse. So it's an incredibly you know, important measurement to be performed. And it was as a result of these measurements, you know, Eddington and Einstein became good friends, as you can imagine, um, and uh, that, that Einstein's theory of relativity slowly you know, started to become accepted uh, by the community. This is really like one of my favorite um, episodes uh, in, in the history of science because it really, really demonstrates how even a theory as brilliant and as groundbreaking and as beautiful as Einstein's theory of general relativity still needed an awful lot of experimental confirmation before the scientific community um, w was able to sort of accept it and before we, you know, we, we kind of adopted this as, as, as a, a valid theory. And um, it was really, you know, as a result, this, this was able to happen as a result of theorists and observers and engineers who build instruments, all kind of working together across borders to make this happen. So it kind of really shows that everybody needs to work together internationally um, for science to really make progress. It also highlights, um, you know, the importance of, of um, because there's so many different sort of uh, you know, anecdotes and it was during the First World War and it's also a really good reminder that science takes place in a very particular time and against a sort of certain geopolitical background which is often very relevant to you know, how science actually gets done. So as Amanda said, you know, my area of science is the development of technology and instruments um, for, uh, astro for astronomical observatories. And uh, I think technology and innovation are very important for the progress of science and that this is actually something that is, uh, that is often sort of a bit underrated really. We hear a lot, we hear a lot in the media about you know, the big ideas, but the real kind of nitty gritty of building instruments and you know, using the technology to, to make progress is not often uh, something that's talked about. So for the next, for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm, I would like to tell you about some of the, uh, the progress that we've made in building astronomical observatories um, and uh, what we're going to, what's going to be coming along in the future and how the sort of technology that's enabling, uh, going to enable us to build all these new facilities. So the thing about astronomy, when you think about experimental astronomy and you know, how, we, how, we do, how we experiment compared with other sciences, it's kind of weird because um, we, have, we have subjects but we can't actually interact with them. So we can't dissect things or we can't scan things or uh, grow things in petri dishes. So you know, our kind of experimental branch of astronomy is quite different from that, the, uh, from that from other sciences. We have just this one laboratory, but the laboratory is our entire universe. So luckily there is no lack of, of subjects to study. But so really, uh, and, and we're also observing this at this one particular snapshot in time from our, from our own vantage point. So really to, to kind of build up this picture of you know, what the universe is um, and of the laws that, that govern its evolution and where it's come from and where it's going, we have to just look, at, look out. We just have to look out and observe as many things as possible in as many different ways as possible to try and build up this story of you know, what the universe really is and how it, how it all works. So in the simplest way, observational astronomy, when we, you know, we just observe the universe, is that we want to be catching photons from, that come, towards, come to us from space. So photons are the carrier particles for electromagnetic radiation, and, and photons have a, characteristic, uh, have a characteristic energy associated with them. And all these different ranges of energies of, of, these, photons, of these photons we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And a lot of this, uh, a lot of these types of radiation and photons are, are very familiar. Um, from the very highest energies we have uh, gamma rays and x-rays all the way to the lowest energy, uh, the radio waves. And because different physical processes produce photons of different kinds of energy, really to, to get a full picture of what's happening in the universe, we want to be observing at all these different, uh, in all, all these different parts of the spectrum. And we have done that so over the last centuries and certainly over the course of the 20th century, we have built observatories to study all, all parts of that electromagnetic spectrum. Um, for the purposes of this talk, 
I'm going to focus on the, the visible and infrared part of the spectrum. All these different telescopes have quite different technologies to detect different energy photons. So it's quite a big, you know, a big subject to cover all of this. So I'm going to focus on the uh, visible and infrared part of the spectrum. This is the part of the spectrum that, mo that stars emit most of their energy at, and so that is also uh, what, our, what our own eyes are most sensitive to, well, are sensitive to. Um, so it's this kind of the picture of the universe that we are the most familiar with. Telescopes on their own are not all that useful for science. So telescopes, we sort of call them light buckets. So what happens in telescopes is that light gets collected and then you use lenses and, and mirrors to sort of redirect it to a focus somewhere. And it's at the focus, then you put an instrument, uh, you know, that used to be maybe the naked eye, but these days we put sophisticated instruments at these focus, focal points. And um, that's where we can record the radiation so that we can then use it for further analysis. Now, the size of the bucket, the size of the telescope, uh, so that's usually sort of the primary mirror um, element, is very important because obviously the bigger your bucket is, the, bigger, the, the more photons you're going to catch, the more light you can receive. And also, the, high, the, the bigger the telescope, the higher the resolution you're able to achieve. So the, fine, the more fine detail you'll be able to resolve uh, in the images. So this is kind of why we, we constantly build uh, you know, bigger telescopes, but we also need the instruments to go alongside them to actually uh, analyze the data, to visualize it, and to record the data. So we can, you know, we can study it later. There are, different, there are many, many different flavors of instruments that people have developed uh, over the years. Um, but you sort of put them into two broad categories, which is a huge you know, oversimplification, but it sort of works. You have imager, an imager, which is essentially a, a camera with which we take you know, beautiful pictures of the night sky. You can see here, this is a, a quite a raw image that from, from some of my own work. Uh, another interesting thing we do with images is sometimes we can sort of put physical masks in, um, in, in the image so to block out light from, from a star so that we can actually image faint structures around it. And I'll show you more images um, of that later on. As a big second category of instruments are spectrographs where we take the light from, from an astrophysical source and disperse it into its sort of component colors, as you can see here. And you may have done... Uh, this kind of experiment at school with a, a, with a prism. Because the spectrum, the spectrum that we then produce, and you can see here some spectra that uh, simulated of a, of, a, of a galaxy in the early universe, all these little squiggles, you know, where you have these, uh, you know, these deep lines, uh, these, that this carry the signature of the chemical composition of what it is you're looking at and of the physical processes that are taking place inside. So this is a very powerful technique. And so you know, a lot of the instruments we, uh, we, we, we build sort of fall into uh, one, one of these categories. So we've known for thousands, well, we've known, we've known for a long time that you know, humans have been uh, monitoring the night sky, watching the night sky, recording what goes on for thousands of years, pretty much you know, as long as uh, you know, um, from the oldest civilizations. We know that things, things happening in the night sky have always fascinated people. But telescopes have only come along really in the last few hundred years, you know, really fairly recently in the history of, uh, of mankind. Um, so here's, this is an image of um, Galileo um, with, his, with one of the earliest telescopes to be used for astronomy. Uh, there is some debate about who actually used, you know, for the first time did uh, observations with an astronomical telescope. So I don't like to say it was Galileo because there's actually a lot of confusion about that. But this was one of the earliest uh, astronomical telescopes. Um, that uh, Galileo produced in Italy in the early, early 17th century, and he very quickly made some very key discoveries uh, with this early telescope, uh, like, the, for example, the four biggest moons of Jupiter, which were actually named after him. Um, from these very earliest observations, you know, technology and, and uh, how to make lenses and mirrors evolved pretty rapidly. And another major milestone was this enormous telescope, which was built uh, in the late 18th century by, uh, by William Herschel, um, uh, an astronomer in the UK. And this, this telescope was absolutely enormous. So it measured the diameter of this, this big tube. This big tube here was about 1.2 meters, which for that time was absolutely enormous. And the, the length of the tube was more than 10 meters. So this was this huge big contraption, which he actually built in his backyard in, the, uh, in Slough, which is an incredibly unexciting suburb of London these days. So, you know, 
Uh, but and it, this actually became a bit of a tourist attraction because it was just such an outlandishly big thing. And William and his sister Caroline used this telescope and several others that they had built themselves in their backyard observatory uh, to make a number of really you know, big discoveries. They discovered uh, the planet Uranus, for example, and they were two, two of the most important astronomers of this era. And the telescopes today Telescopes today look completely different from those earliest models. So things have continued to evolve. And really now our telescopes are located on remote mountain tops in deserts, high, uh, high up on mountains to try and get away from the, from the atmosphere. Uh, we build them in these very kind of sci-fi type buildings. And we even, we've even launched telescopes into space now. So we have numerous observatories. Um, in, in space that are performing uh, astronomical observations uh, every day around the clock um, just to get away out from the Earth's atmosphere. We also don't build them alone anymore so most of our major observatories now are built with our friends um, so there's lots of you know major alliances sometimes those are you know private just with it between universities we have national and international space agencies uh, in Europe, we have an organization called ESO, who uh, manage a whole range of um, uh, astronomical observatories in the Southern Hemisphere, most, many of them in South America. Um, so, so we kind of, you know, this, this has become a really kind of global uh, endeavor, and we, you know, we work together in, uh, internationally uh, to make these huge big projects happen. And with all these modern telescopes all around the world, we've, you know, looking in all different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, we've really been able to build up a remarkable picture of our universe, of the universe that we live in. Uh, so this is a very sort of simplified cartoon uh, of the history of the universe. So we know it, uh, it was created uh, almost 14 billion years ago, 13.7 billion years ago in this strange event, which we just call the Big Bang. And, uh, and, and then the universe kind of in inflated very rapidly. Again, it's very sort of exotic uh, things going on at the, at the start of the, you know, when the universe was first created. Um, and slowly over, you know, millions, hundreds of millions and millions of years, um, you know, structures started forming, the first stars formed, galaxies formed. And today, the universe continues to sort of expand all uh, away from us. And we even know that this expansion is accelerating under the force of this mysterious energy which we call dark energy and that's you know one of the biggest you know the which is a very big mystery that we still face in, in astronomy here you see a beautiful computer simulation of um, of the universe of the very young universe before any structures had really started forming so the universe was sort of quite soupy at that time with all these you know fluctuations in the density and as we we now have these simulations which we can model how the universe evolved and how slowly over time uh, these density pockets would collapse and form bigger structures under the force of gravity um, and then the first sources of light started switching on uh, and forming, you know, uh, forming galaxies and groups of galaxies. So you can see here this is sort of what the universe, what, what we think the universe sort of looks like today. And every point in this, in this, uh, in this map is, is an individual galaxy. So we see this, you know, this sort of strings, this very filamentary structure um, in, in the universe around us. Now you think this is a beautiful picture, this is a computer simulation, so this is not you know, very real. But in fact, with modern telescopes, we've been able to produce this, which is a real map of the galaxies around us. Um, so you can really see this kind of, you know, every point in this map is, again, a galaxy. So you really see um, that the, the, this filamentary structure, that web of galaxies around us, is really real. And it's remarkable that we've actually been able to map that uh, in our local universe. And this map was created with a dedicated telescope, um, uh, which, which was really built to just map huge portions of the sky. And we have a number of these telescopes uh, that really just survey the sky. So they, they, that's their purpose, is they, they produce these huge maps of the sky to really kind of um, image hundreds and hundreds of thousands of galaxies. Uh, this telescope is at, um, is at an observatory in New Mexico in the US. It's a two and a half meter telescope, and it's carried out the, what's known as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which um, has produced kind of the most uh, detailed three-dimensional map of our local universe. So it's remarkable that, you know, that we've been able to kind of really see this kind of this structure of galaxies all around us. 
I mentioned we've launched telescopes in space. This, again, has been a huge achievement of the last few decades. Uh, and in fact, it was uh, 25 years ago this year uh, um, since the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. The Hubble was a collaboration between the US Space Agency, NASA, and the European Space Agency. Um, and the telescope is in, in a low Earth orbit, so it orbits the, it orbits the Earth. Um, and it has been uh, serviced many times, so its, its instrument suite has been upgraded a number of times. And it's really been uh, you know, a really remarkable project uh, in, in science, not just in astronomy, but I think really in science. Um, Hubble is not the only telescope we have in space. Uh, we actually have a number of uh, space-based observatories. Um, I've just uh, sh shown a few here, but you know, lots of different countries have built space telescopes um, for astrophysical observations. One of Big Hubble's kind of key, uh, key findings, key contributions to our understanding uh, of the universe is this image, and there's a number of generations of this image even. Um, in the first few years uh, after the, the launch of Hubble, astronomers actually proposed to point Hubble at an empty part of the sky, which is not usually a, a great justification for actually being allocated time on a telescope, um, just to, you know, to point at nothing. Um, so they had to jump through some hoops to actually get this, you know, to be allowed to do this. And, um, but, you know, they were, they were allocated time in the end. And so um, at the time, we, didn't, we, did, we hadn't really seen many galaxies in the early universe, so we didn't, we didn't really know what the early, early universe looked like. But this image is, you know, Hubble stared at this, uh, this small portion of, of the sky. So this, the um, size of this box is about, about the tenth of the uh, size of the full moon. So it's really very quite, quite small. Um, and so Hubble took these images over more than 100 hours. Oh, I think it was over Christmas. Um, so they were allocated time over Christmas when it was like, well, you know, there won't be that much support at, at the time. Um, we can just look at that. Um, and what came out was this image. And it was just every single point you can see in there is an individual galaxy. And there are galaxies in this image that are uh, really sort of go back to the first, say, billion years of the universe's existence. So this was really kind of kind of mind-blowing, really, because it, it, it pushed our knowledge of, um, of, of, of galaxies throughout cosmic time uh, so much further than it had been. And it's really kind of gave this huge impetus, this whole research field of galaxy evolution um, throughout the history of the universe. And this was a really sort of key uh, finding with the Hubble Space Telescope. On the ground, too, um, technology has continued to evolve. So uh, at the moment, our biggest telescopes on the ground uh, measure uh, sort of 8 to 10 meters in size, and that's in the size of their primary mirrors. And they're kind of uh, technologically incredibly sophisticated. So most of them are operated uh, remotely um, from control rooms or even from you know, hundreds of miles away. Uh, they'll have multiple instrument stations so that they can you know, do different kinds of observations all within the course of a, of a single night. Um, and they're located in very sort of remote and exotic locations. Um, one, of the, one of the key findings with our sort of current uh, large ground-based telescopes um, is that we've been able to establish that centre of our galaxy, and this is a nice kind of artist's impression of it, showing our location here but that the centre of our galaxy harbours a huge big uh, black hole that has the same mass as you know, several millions of suns. Uh, and so we've been able to measure its mass to quite, you know, to quite high precision. Um, and that's been like a really sort of, uh, you know, a, it was very challenging observations and it's a real a remarkable achievement that we've been able to measure this. So the way we measured that is basically because we know we've been able to track in the very core, very dense uh, core of the galaxy, we've been able to track the orbits of stars um, uh, whizzing around the centre, uh, which you can see they're sort of marked with the star, over more than a decade. So we've, we've been able to observe the, the paths of these stars around the centre of the galaxy um, in, in such detail that we can uh, see the full orbit and that we can measure very accurately what the mass is of that thing here at the centre. Um, and that's something that... Uh, you really need a big telescope for to achieve very high resolution because these, these are very high precision, me precision measurements. Um, and so the, the fact that we've been able to do this over, you know, over more than a decade and put all this data together is really fantastic. Um, another hugely um, exciting new field in astrophysics, which has only really existed for a couple of decades, again, it's actually 20 years ago exactly, um, 
since we discovered the first planet around another another star, another normal regular star, but you know similar to our own sun, and you know 20 years is not a long time for a scientific for a scientific field to sort of exist, um, and we've just made remarkable progress. We we now know of you know thousands um, of of planets around other stars uh, in our own galaxy, so this is a huge new area of research. This here is the Kepler Space Telescope, which is a huge big NASA mission, which has made huge contribution to this and has been responsible for really kind of uh, growing the number of known exoplanets from a few to you know, hundreds and thousands. And here you can actually see a little uh, diagram of all the known, uh, of, of a whole range of, uh, of known planetary systems as they kind of go around their host stars, and this actually, you know, goes back to 2012, so this is actually, you know, by now really quite outdated. Um, so the really kind of the wealth of, the, you know, the wealth of new data we have on these planetary systems is really fascinating and is a really exciting area of science. Um, we can't just detect that they're there, we can actually, you know, we, our, our observatories also allow us to, you know, um, look at them directly, to image them directly. So here you see some images. This is with a uh, ground-based telescope, and this is with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, images where we've blocked out the light from the central star um, so that these, these tiny little faint planets in their vicinity, you know, that we've been able to actually image them directly. And here, with this, this particular uh, uh, star system, this is a very uh, nearby star that um, has been uh, imaged with Hubble on a number of occasions. We can e we've even been able to image the planet actually moving along its orbit uh, over the years. Um, we've even been able to also um, measure spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. So we're really starting to even be able to look at the chemistry in the atmospheres of, uh, of these new worlds. Um, so, and this is all just, you know, with, with our current kind of uh, world-class facilities. So these are just some of the sort of key science areas for our future telescopes. So we want to learn more about all these, uh, these new planetary systems that we've been uh, discovering. And, of course, the ultimate goal, the ultimate thing we want to know is, like, is there life on these other planets? Um, the nature of dark energy, like why, why do we see you know, the, the, the universe accelerating away from us? Like what is that, what is that force driving that acceleration? Um, and how did these first galaxies uh, form and evolve? Or what did they look like? Uh, what were the, what the sort of the physics was behind how they formed and how they have evolved uh, in, you know, into things like the Milky Way galaxy that we see around us today? So these are some of the key questions that our future observatories, observatories are going to try and address. And the first of the sort of future observatories, which is really around the corner, <coughs> that I'd like to talk about is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the next major kind of um, a flag flagship space observatory um, for, um, th that's being built by, by NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. So it's a huge, big international collaboration. Um, and this is really, so this is going to be, it's, it's often billed as the successor to Hubble, but really it's not, it's not going to replace Hubble as such. It's, it's actually a very different telescope, but its design is really optimized to build on those areas where Hubble made its biggest scientific contributions. Here's just some of like what you know some of the key components of the telescope. So, you know, it's 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 a uh, big feature is this huge big mirror uh, measuring six and a half meters in diameter. So compared with Hubble's two and a half in terms of collecting area, that's more than six times more collecting area that the mirror has. Um, there's instruments mounted uh, sort of in a module here on the back of the mirror. There's some sort of communications and solar panels, and then there's this huge big uh, this sail almost that it looks like, which is a, a, a sun shield that's designed to shield the telescope from the, the heat and the light that's coming from, coming from the sun to keep it sort of very thermally stable uh, and to reduce the sort of the, the, the infrared background that otherwise it would receive uh, from the sun. The key difference between uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb is that James Webb has, is optimized to observe the universe at infrared wavelengths, whereas Hubble looked at invisible light. So it's just a little bit shifted along, along that electromagnetic spectrum. So why is that? So that was a very uh, important sort of design decision. 
So the expansion of the universe, the effect it has on the light, as it, as the light from distant sources as it travels to us, is that it stretches us. You know, this is similar to what you see in like the, the Doppler effect. Um, so the further away, the further away a, a, a galaxy is from us, the, it's receding away from us, and so the light that we receive gets stretched to to longer radio wavelengths. So to be able to push further and further back into the history of the universe, we want to see galaxies earlier and earlier in the universe to really see these first galaxies as they formed. Uh, we have to be able to observe further into the infrared. And so that's one of the key goals of, um, of the James Webb Space Telescope. The infrared as well, you know, you see infrared light kind of probes sort of slightly different physical processes. So here you see, for example, the Orion Nebula, so, you know, very big star forming region uh, inside our own galaxy. Um, in the constellation of Orion. Um, here you can see this invisible light, and so in the visible light, what you can see is the light from the mature stars and of the hot gas that's being lit up by this sort of central cluster of, star of young stars here that's formed. So this is all sort of very, you know, very luminous hot gas. In the infrared, on the other hand, um, the, the, you see more light coming from all this structure around it. So this is basically sort of gas and dust that's a bit cooler. Um, surrounding the central region where the cluster is and where this, you know, in this hole here is where, you know, that you have the, the much hotter gas, which you don't see so much in the infrared. All these green dots here that you can see are young stars in the process of forming. So, you know, it's basically, again, in the infrared, you sort of probe cooler and dusty, dustier regions uh, of the galaxy. So what you really see where stars are forming and planets may be forming around them. So these are, you know, the, these are some of the biggest questions that we hope to be able to answer with James Webb. Another big difference with Hubble is that James Webb is not actually going uh, in Earth orbit. Uh, James Webb is being sent much further away to a point called the second Lagrangian point, L2. Uh, these Lagrangian points are sort of quasi-stable points in the gravitational system between the Earth and the Sun. So basically a telescope that's here can kind of ha have quite a stable gravitational orbit uh, around that point. And so it's sort of as the Earth goes around the Sun, the telescope moves along with it behind it, but it's basically mostly in the shade of uh, behind the Earth, so it doesn't get a lot of direct sunlight. And so this is a million and a half kilometers away, uh, so this is, you know, really you know, very far away, and as a result, we also won't be able to go, uh, go up and service it uh, to replace its instruments, so that's another key difference uh, with Hubble. Now, a telescope the size of James Webb um, is really, you know, is really challenging to actually launch into space. And the telescope, as, uh, you know, as you saw it in the previous image, doesn't actually fit into any of our launch vehicles. So one of the really big sort of technological challenges of this telescope was to, um, was to actually you know, get it into space. And so what the designers have had to do is actually fold it up. And so you can see here the process of, of it unfolding in space after the launch. Um, and so this is you know, an incredibly uh, challenging thing to achieve. Um, And we all hope that's going to go very well when it launches in 2018. <laughs> this is hugely sped up. This actually takes place over, over, over the course of a few weeks as it travels to, uh, to the second Lagrangian point. They cut this off at a strange time, so I'll just play it again. But you can see the solar, the so sun shields have to un unroll, which is a very tricky part because it's very, and they have to separate out and they have to be tensioned without the breaking. And then the mirror, even the mirror is sort of folded up and then it has to, it has to fold out uh, into its final shape. And this is something that's really never been done before with a space telescope. Oh, I think we should stop that now. Right. I mentioned that the telescope has this instrument module. Um, so it has, it has these four instruments on board. Um, I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but so, the, uh, so you have a, a whole variety of images and spectrographs uh, in the near infrared and also in the, in the mid infrared. And in fact, this is the, the mid infrared instrument, which was um, a collaboration between a, a European consortium of institutes and NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And this is the instrument I've been involved in for a number of years. Um, but you can see here also the schematic of how they actually fit together these instruments on, that, on the sort of uh, the module that then will get bolted onto uh, the rest of the spacecraft. Um, 
each of these instruments is, you know, incredibly complex uh, and is a real kind of achievement uh, to, to, to get built. They're not very big, these instruments, so here you actually see a picture of, um, uh, of MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument, uh, just being put in the cargo of uh, the British Airways flight from Heathrow to Washington DC when we, when we officially delivered it to NASA. So we don't, get, we don't send these with cargo planes because essentially it fits onto a tabletop. So we just had to buy it a ticket on British Airways. Um, so these instruments are now all at NASA, on, uh, at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And actually we've just gone into the final major test campaign for these instruments. Um, before they will then get sent to uh, NASA Houston, where everything, you know, the whole observatory will sort of be assembled all together and ready for launch in 2018. So it's a really exciting time for, for James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and this, and the, the observatory will have sort of global access, so the Australian community will also be able to observe with, with uh, James Webb. Here's just a simulation um, of, of what James Webb might be able to achieve. So here you can see just a, a snapshot from that Hubble Deep Field image that I showed with all these beautiful uh, galaxies in the early universe. So just sort of uh, extracted uh, one galaxy here. And scientists have been performing simulations to, to kind of see how James Webb will see these, these galaxies uh, when it launches with, it, it, with its new instruments. Um, and so here you can see you know, the difference between uh, you know, the, the performance of Hubble and that of James Webb. And so the fact that it's got this much bigger mirror means that, uh, and, and better sensitivity means that, you know, you'll be able to resolve all so much finer detail uh, in these very distant galaxies. So that's very exciting. On the ground as well, we have a number of uh, huge big uh, telescopes that are uh, in the works. Um, one major project here, especially for the Australian community, is called the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is uh, due to come online in the early 2020s. Um, this, is, this mirror is a really unusual design because its, pr its primary mirror is kind of the, it has this sort of petal shape of um, seven individual mirrors. Uh, each of these mirrors, which you can see, these are all beautiful artist conceptions, each of these mirrors measures 8.4 meters in diameter, which make, would, makes it pretty much um, each of these mirrors would today be, you know, the biggest, the biggest mirror, telescope mirror in existence, really. So each of these mirrors is really kind of at the forefront of what we can, what we can do in uh, optical manufacturing uh, at that sort of level of precision. Um, the fourth, actually, there's actually three of them, these mirrors that have already been produced, and I think the fourth is uh, kind of in, in production now. This whole structure, this whole telescope will be about 1,100 tonnes in weight, um, it will have in total an effective diameter of 24 and a half meters and the whole uh, observatory is going to be built uh, high up in the Chilean Andes uh, where there's already a lot of other telescopes so we know there's very extremely good observing conditions so it's going to be a really powerful new facility. Uh, here's you know you see a nice little diagram of what this, uh, these mirrors are going, to, are going to look like and I found this picture here of uh, the fourth mirror um, being, being sort of constructed they're kind of it's they're kind of built on these sort of honeycomb structures to keep them very lightweight, and I'll sort of talk about that um, a bit later on as well. Uh, the GMT is just one of three of these major uh, ground-based telescope projects. Um, in Europe, we have a counterpart called the European Extremely Large Telescope. You see, we waste no money on finding cool names for our telescopes. Um, and this is going to come along in about 2024, and that measures, uh, has a, di a primary mirror diameter of about 39 meters. So it's going to be a bit bigger than the giant Magellan telescope. Uh, and this is also going to be built in, uh, this is in Chile, in the very northern Atacama Desert. So these are hugely exciting projects that will really be able to answer uh, questions in all different areas of science. So be it, you know, uh, exoplanets and galaxies at high redshift and star formation inside our own galaxy and really a whole wealth of science and also things that we probably don't even know yet. Uh, what's exciting is that you know many of our telescopes, the biggest, their biggest contributions are things that we had no idea they would do. So that aspect of, of observational astronomy is very exciting. Now, when William Herschel built his, uh, his big telescope in his backyard uh, in Slough, he already commented on the fact that actually a big telescope like that is kind of, kind of a bit cumbersome to work with. Um, the bigger you want to make the mirror, if you want the mirror to hold its shape, um, 
that you know you have to you have to also build it thicker because otherwise it won't it won't be able to hold its shape. So the bigger this sort of these bigger and bulkier these mirrors become, it also then puts stress on the rest of the structure and everything kind of starts flexing and sagging, which makes it harder to kind of maintain alignment. So one of the key technologies behind being able to build uh, larger telescopes, uh, especially you know, on the ground, is um, being able to build lightweight mirrors. Um, and there are various ways that we've been able to achieve that. So one of the earliest experiments here uh, was um, with the, the mirror of the five meter hill telescope at Mount Palomar, uh, which is a really remarkable telescope because it's still pretty cutting edge today and this was actually constructed in the 1940s. So this is a, the Palomar mirror was the first time where they successfully managed to um, uh, make this mirror uh, you know, much lighter weight than it normally uh, would be if it had been a solid block. And they did this by creating this sort of honeycomb structure in the back. So they, the, the mirror was cast on these sort of honeycomb structure, which were then, the honeycombs were then removed, which left these, you know, these holes, which meant that this wasn't entirely filled with material. And I think this mirror only weighed something like 60% of what it would have done if it had been uh, completely solid. Um, and this meant that you know, the stresses on the structure were much less, and so this uh, you know, the telescope was much better as a result. Um, we've also developed technologies to make very thin, uh, we call them meniscus mirrors, so very thin mirrors, um, but to stop them from sagging under their, own, uh, under their own weight as they move around the sky, we, uh, we, can, we actively control the shape. So they get fitted with, uh, with actuators uh, on the bottom side and their shape is continually monitored uh, with, with you know, additional measurement devices. And so then as the telescope moves around the sky, the engineers can tweak the shape of the mirror by, sort of by prodding it in the right location um, to, so that it keeps its shape. And the first experiments with this technology were performed in the, in the late 1980s uh, with a, te uh, a telescope called the New Technology Telescope, which was uh, in Chile. Uh, and this is a very common technique now. So all these, um, uh, like the giant Magellan telescope, these mirrors will all have this sort of active control of, their mirror sh of the mirror shape. And this has made a huge difference to, uh, to our ground-based observatories. Um, Another, another technology that we currently use a lot on our large telescopes is uh, segmentation. So rather than make one huge big mirror, we kind of tile it in these sorts of, uh, you know, with individual smaller um, hexagonal tiles, which we can then all put together to, to create a much bigger hole. And that gives us a huge amount of scalability. Um, some of the first examples of this is, was in the early 90s with the 10 meter Keck telescopes, which uh, are still operational today in Hawaii. Um, and, and a number of other telescopes have implemented this same technology. And this is what is going to be applied, for example, on the European Extremely Large Telescope, and also which is being used for the James Webb in space. This will be the first segmented mirror that we launch into space. Now, again, this has to come with a huge amount of additional technology. Each of these individual segments has, has sort of actuators uh, mounted behind it so to, to make sure that they, all the segments stay nicely lined up together um, as the telescope moves, so the sort of the, the angles and the positioning of these segments is continuously monitored um, so to, keep a, to keep a nice shape uh, of, the, uh, of the mirror. And for the ELT, we'll have something like 800 individual ones of these segments, so that measurement that has to be continuously made is hugely challenging computationally as well. Another aspect of doing astronomy from the ground is the fact that we have to observe through the Earth's atmosphere. So the atmosphere is great for life, there would be no life on Earth without the atmosphere, but it is terrible for astronomy, and this is also something that even from the days of Isaac Newton, uh, astronomers have lamented and have been very vocal about. So <laughs> when you, um, what happens when starlight reaches the atmosphere, you know, the atmosphere is this, this layer of turbulent gas that sits around us, you know, several tens of kilometers in, in thickness, um, and you know, there's a lot of gas motions and turbulence and lots of things swirling around and temperature differences. So when the light from stars passes through this, it sort of gets, you know, gets a little messed up. So this is actually what a point, you know, what a star in the sky, if you were to observe it with a big telescope, you actually get something like this. Um, we all know, for example, also that stars twinkle when you look at them, and that is, again, uh, a manifestation of that same, you know, of that same effect. So obviously, this, you know, this is not, this, 
basically means that you know, starlight just becomes this big blurry mess. And so this very strongly limits the, you know, the performance of telescopes here on the ground. And in fact, for quite a long time, astronomers thought that doing astronomy from the ground was just was, was kind of a dead-end street. And this is what was one of the big drivers for, for building space telescopes. But we now have technology, uh, this was sort of uh, actually technology developed in the military that allows us to correct for this in real time. And this is what we call adaptive optics. Um, so this is, a pretty this is a fairly sort of challenging technology to implement. So when, when the light from a star comes in, part of the light gets redirected. So the, you, you have most of the light that goes to the science instrument you want to, you, you know, you want to use for your science. But part of the light is split off and is used to actually, in a separate, whole separate instrument to kind of measure what the distortions actually are that you're receiving uh, through, through the atmosphere. And this is, this is then analyzed and these distortions are then sent, the information about these distortions is then sent to uh, a, a bendy mirror upstream. So this is a kind of mirror that's got actuators on it that can deform and that then changes its shape to correct for those distortions. Now the problem is that the, the conditions in the atmosphere really change on the scale of, of milliseconds. So this, this whole loop, so this is a kind of a, a closed loop operation, this actually has to be done you know, hundreds of times per second, ideally. So this is sort of this huge kind of closed loop operation that's continuously operating. The shape of this mirror is continuously updating um, to keep the light from the, you know, to keep the light coming in nice and sharp. And so here is a you know, really nice animation of that very dense region at the centre of our galaxy where there's lots and lots of stars packed in together. Um, and you can see how it evolves between, you know, having an, an, an adaptive optic system switched on. This is before it switches on, so all the stars are sort of blurred together. And when you switch the adaptive optic system on, suddenly you have these beautiful sharp images. So this is, you know, a very key technology that's really sort of reinvigorated uh, our ground-based astronomy in the last few decades. We even now shoot lasers out of our telescopes. Um, if, you know, if, if there's not enough light to actually uh, perform the measurements to, that we need for, to do these corrections, we now have lasers that we can shoot out of our telescopes that will produce an artificial star with which uh, we can actually then perform that measurement for those corrections. So there's all kinds of exotic things being trialed with, you know, whole arrays of these artificial stars that we project next to our science targets so, uh, to keep you know, to keep our images nice and sharp. This is a fantastic technology. Uh, these are some actually recent images from a telescope, uh, from the, the Gemini telescope, another telescope in Chile, that is trialing all kinds of new technology uh, in adaptive optics uh, that's been able to produce this absolutely beautiful map of an explosive outflow around a young star, again, in the Orion uh, star-forming region. Um, so the, the, the amount of detail that we see in these images that you can see here is really, you know, rival, rivals what we do with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, from, from space. So this is really very beautiful. And this, is, this technology has been key to paving the way to these giant telescopes like the Giant Magellan Telescope and like the, e, the European ELT um, on, the, on the ground. Without this sort of technology, there is, you know, we wouldn't have been able to kind of really exploit the size of those apertures. Um, it's a very multidisciplinary technology, so it brings together expertise from all these different areas. And it's actually something that astronomy has been able to um, give to other industries, like medicine, for example, for producing very high resolution uh, images in, in some areas of medicine. I always like to sort of finish off with this, you know, innovation is not just about uh, building new kits, it's not just about building uh, hardware. So astronomy has been uh, very innovative in the sciences, I think, with how it um, stores and shares its data. So we have uh, a lot of the data that our big observatories gather is all made public to the entire community, and so we have great archives where we can just search uh, for data from lots and lots of different telescopes. Um, we also um, have lots of kind of images out there on the internet. So. Uh, especially for the Hubble Space Telescope, um, a huge amount of effort is put into producing these beautiful images and making them freely available to anybody to use. And, you know, some might argue that that's just, you know, making nice pictures and it's just a PR thing, but, you know, we've got to the point now where we have sci-fi films uh, with incredibly, you know, a realistic imagery of space. Um, we have films where, you know, George Clooney goes to fix the Hubble Space Telescope 
Um, we have fashion designers that put Hubble images on their clothes and sell them for lots of money. Uh, and these, you know, these are all kind of really important parts of popular culture and of an economy in a sense. Um, and so obviously this is not why we built the Hubble Space Telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope, but it goes to show that this sort of openness that we have uh, with our data, we share data, we, 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 we share our images, that that kind of creates a, an impact in places where you know, we, we, we wouldn't expect it. And I think that's a very important way that the scientists can engage with wider culture. Um, I think that's an, you know, an important aspect of doing science as well. So to wrap up, this is uh, really sort of the, the, the message I wanted to, to really give is that I think technology and innovation are hugely important to scientific progress and really astronomy is, you know, demonstrates that very well. It's a very strong driver of technology and we often use kind of technologies that are really at the cutting edge of what we can do in a number of areas, so computing and optical manufacturing. Um, and these sort of these giant telescopes that we're building in the future, using that real kind of modern technology, uh, is going to help us answer the, some of the most fundamental questions uh, that face you know science today. Is that this nature of the nature of this mysterious force of dark energy, um, how the first galaxies formed in the universe, and how they've evolved uh, to those that we see around us today, and ultimately, hopefully, maybe that we'll be able to find life in the universe and uh, learn more about it. Thanks very much.